Hi, Marco. Hi, good to see you. Okay, Lee, I think we could start. Yes, I think so. Uh, good afternoon um, and welcome everyone to this afternoon's online debate. Uh, this is the first of what we hope will be um, a very regular series of debates on uh, issues in energy regulation in the EU. And I'm very pleased to be co-organizing, co-hosting and co-moderating uh, with Alberto. Um, so I'm taking turns with him. Um, this week I'm the host and um, I will hand over the floor to him as my main function this week is timekeeping. And Alberto will introduce the subject matter and I will uh, then introduce our different speakers as uh, they appear on the programme. Thank you very much, Alberto. Thank you very much, uh, Lee. Um, good afternoon to everyone. Um, just one piece of housekeeping information. This debate is uh, uh, live streamed and will be recorded on and available on our YouTube channel, the FSI YouTube channel. So um, just be aware that um, it will be publicly available and we have more than 210 participants um, registered for this event. Let me start by saying that hydrogen is clearly an important contributor to the EU, has become an important contributor to the EU decarbonization strategy. Um, a lot is debated about how much hydrogen we will need, how much we will have, and uh, of which color. And in fact, I think by now we have an almost full rainbow of uh, hydrogen types. Now, I personally find this debate uh, indeed quite fascinating, but the confidence intervals around many of the uh, predictions and estimates which are offered for this debate are quite large. And as we know, uh, you know all predictions and, and forecasts are done uh, more often than not to be proved wrong by reality uh, later on. So in my view, a more useful um, exercise is to see how we can provide the right environment for hydrogen and other energy vectors, decarbonized and renewable energy vectors, could contribute towards the uh, achievement of uh, the ambitious energy and climate policy target that we, the European Union set for itself. Uh, in this context, for example, at the Florence School of Regulation, we are working on the possibility of using guarantees of origin as part of an approach to promote the achievement of the renewable energy target at least cost. But this will be the focus of another debate next week. Today, we are focusing on the regulation of uh, um, and the regulatory treatment of the infrastructure transporting and hydrogen, which is also an important uh, component of this enabling environment for the energy transition. We have, de we have developed quite some experience on the regulation of gas and electricity networks over the last few years. And so the, the first question we should ask ourselves is whether this, a similar approach should be used uh, for uh, hydrogen um, transport infrastructure. If this is the case, if, we, if the answer to this question is yes, then I think the issue is relatively simple. Uh, we can do some sort of um, uh, cut and pasting um, however, if hydrogen transmission infrastructures are different then, uh, or exhibit different characteristics, then we are on different grounds. Now, as we know, in reality, what matters is not as much uh, as the technical characteristics of, uh, of the pipelines of the transmission infrastructure, but rather their cost structure. And here I believe that there should be some similarity between the hydrogen infrastructure and gas infrastructure. In fact, the gas infrastructure, some of the gas infrastructure will be used to transport hydrogen, but also very relevant would be the availability of alternative ways of transporting hydrogen economically. These are the issues and questions that um, this debate will try to address. So I will now give the, I guess the video, uh, not the floor, the video back to Lee uh, to introduce the other speakers and the panelists and wish all of you uh, an interesting discussion today. Thank you very much, Lee. Thank you very much indeed, Alberta, for a very succinct um, introduction, keeping to the time. Um, thank you. So I would like now to um, hand uh, the, the video or the floor 
uh, to uh, Tudor Contonesco uh, from uh, DG Energy, um, who is going to take us through the EU hydrogen strategy. Tudor, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. I don't. Um, um, uh, Lee, I'm afraid. Still waiting, I think. For yes. we had him earlier, but uh, maybe he's had to reconnect. I'm afraid we will have to wait for his intervention. Maybe another speaker can take the floor in the meantime, and we will try to support him. So. Perhaps um, we could turn to the second speaker on the program um, because of, unfortunately, of course, we only have a, a limited um, time uh, available here. So uh, Piero, would you like to um, introduce us to the hydrogen sector uh, cost structure? Uh, Piero is from the Florence School of Regulation and has been doing considerable research in this area. Thank you, Lee. Um... So good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Piero Calados Reis, as mentioned, and um, I'll be presenting some of the research we're currently doing at the Florence School of Regulation around the hydrogen sector cost structure. In particular, in this presentation, I would like to focus on the analysis and cost figures of hydrogen transport technologies in view of the following panel debate on the regulation of future hydrogen infrastructure. Um, to play with a bit the joke of the title of this in this same webinar, um, we'll have multiple new wine brands, some in old bottles, some in new bottles, and I'll show you some of these bottles we have available. Um, the presentation, the outline of this presentation is the following. Um, first, I'll present you a frame in order to understand the critical assumptions of the line hydrogen transport costs, and successfully, we apply this frame in order to analyze hydrogen transport costs over short distances and over long distances according to two major sources. Finally, we'll also investigate some of the transport costs within EU scenarios of imported hydrogen. The frame for understanding the critical assumptions of hydrogen transport costs, is, which we propose, is the following. It's based on four critical assumptions or dimensions. First one being the distance. So are we speaking about short distances below or equal to some few hundreds of kilometers or are we actually speaking about long distances which could be from some hundreds of kilometers to even thousands of kilometers? Secondly, which are the transport means we are considering? Land-based pipelines, undersea pipelines, shipping or even trucks. Third dimension, the state of the hydrogen transported meaning we might transport hydrogen not only as a gas with the relative compression costs, but we might even transport it in its liquid phase or even through some other intermediate hydrogen carrier molecules. This would involve the relative conversion and reconversion costs. And some examples of intermediate hydrogen carrier molecules would be, for example, ammonia or LOHC, liquid organic hydrogen carrier. The fourth and final dimension is the volume. Are we speaking about a few tons of hydrogen to be transported per day or some hundreds of tons of hydrogen per day? Um, this will also have an impact on the hydrogen transport costs. Two flags I would like to raise here is the, are the following. Um, we'll not be dealing with hydrogen blended with natural gas, which is totally different category compared to the pure hydrogen transport. And secondly, in the future, we might well see potentially some safety issues impacting on the availability of certain combinations of transport means and state of hydrogen transported. So for example, if the toxicity of ammonia is deemed such that truck transport of hydrogen through ammonia is not made, let's say, available for city transport, well, that might also impact on the, on the considerations we might have to play in the future. So, 
with this frame, we proceed to analyze hydrogen transport costs over short distances. Here by short distances, I mean distances below or equal to some few hundreds of kilometers. And in particular, I present data from two major sources, respectively, Bloomberg New Energy Finance cost data for 2019 on the left, and IEA cost data for an undefined, not clearly defined time horizon on the right. What we can notice is the following. Um, both organizations consider for short distances transport, both pipeline and truck transport as transport means. And they also present a variety of possible state of hydrogen for, uh, which will be transported. So for example, Bloomberg and Energy Finance considers the pipeline transport of gaseous hydrogen and the truck transport of gaseous hydrogen or even hydrogen converted into LOHC, liquid organic hydrogen carrier. IA also presents the possibility of the truck transport of hydrogen converted into its liquid phase or even ammonia. In terms of the fourth dimension, the volume, we see that Bloomberg and Energy Finance clearly relates the, how volume impacts on the cost of hydrogen transport, higher volumes, less costs. Whereas for IEA, um, this relationship is only specified for pipeline transport. Now proceeding to the final cost figures, what we do notice is that the old models, meaning pipeline transport, <coughs> are considered the cheapest options for short distance compared to truck transport. We do notice some range of variability across both, but this relationship is quite clear here. Now we proceed for to the analysis of hydrogen transport costs over long distances. By long distances, I mean distances between some hundreds and thousands of kilometers. We consider both the same sources as before, so data from Bloomberg and Energy Finance and IEA. And what we do notice the following, in terms of transport means, Bloomberg and Energy Finance considers three different transport means, pipeline transport, shipping transport, and truck transport whereas IA is considered to only the first two. In terms of the state of hydrogen transported, there are some slight differences. Um, so for example, IEA includes also pipeline transport of hydrogen converted into ammonia or ship transport of hydrogen converted into its liquid phase or into LOHC. Whereas for Bloomberg and Energy Finance, uh, we can see that only the pipeline transport of gaseous hydrogen and the ship transport of uh, hydrogen converted into ammonia are included. So the same observation for volume we can draw, but more interesting will be to analyze the costs here. And what we do notice is that both of them converge on the notion that here again, pipeline transport is the cheapest option. So the old bottles are still winning, although I wouldn't put my wine there, to be honest. Um, and in terms of the ship transport of hydrogen, we notice that there is a slight divergence in terms of the cost um, estimates. Now, having said this, we proceed to the final bit of analysis. So which will be the role of transport costs within EU scenarios of imported hydrogen? Now, of course, we can expect transport costs to play a relevant role for hydrogen imported in EU. And here I present five examples of these scenarios by the same organizations, IA and Bloomberg and Energy Finance. And one example relative to 2030 and the other four relative to 2050. Now, what we do notice that there is quite a variety of transport means considered. So pipeline transport and ship transport and also state of hydrogen, which could be pipeline transport of ammonia or ship transport of ammonia liquid hydrogen. And also the same conclusions as we drew before relative to transport costs are, can also be found here. So pipeline transport is the cheapest option, whereas cheap transport is a more expensive option. And if we do analyze also the share of transport costs relative to total import costs, uh, we do notice that the share of this transport costs in the case of shipping are more relevant than for the case of pipeline transport. Um, with these, I drew the major conclusions. Um, I'd like to thank you for your attention. For more questions and information, please send me an email and we will also be soon publishing a report uh, with this information entitled the cost effective EU decarbonization study. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you very much indeed, Piero. That was indeed a, a very informative um, presentation in the short, short, short term available to you. Um, hopefully, we will now have um, our guest speaker joining us um, from the EU. I'll just wait a couple of seconds to see if he has come on board. Well, I think we will not be the, the only webinar where the keynote comes in at the very end. That happens quite frequently. Um, so I think, again, as we have a very limited uh, amount of time available to us, the best thing will be to proceed <laughs> uh, to the panel uh, discussion. And um, hopefully um, the panel um, are all very familiar with the ins and outs um, of the various options and the, the rainbow of colors um, in the hydrogen strategy, that they will be happy to, to make a few introductory comments while we're waiting for uh, Tudor to, to join us and to introduce then um, the EU view. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry about this, but um, we were all um, set up beforehand, but these hitches seem to happen. So Christopher, could I turn the floor over to you, please, to make some introductory remarks? Uh, I know you're very familiar with the EU hydrogen strategy and uh, you have views upon it. So it would be really helpful if you could share them with us and hopefully Tudor will, will join and uh, comment on your comments, perhaps. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Lee. Um... And I'll, I'll make some comments also following on the work that uh, we've been doing with Piero on the study that he mentioned. Um, and I'd like to um, divide my comments into two areas. Um, one is I'd, li I'd like to expand slightly the discussion um, in relation to infrastructure to more widely in relation to hydrogen and setting hydrogen policy. Um, and then talk about infrastructure because the two things are inherently linked. Um, you don't build infrastructure before you have demand for a product and you don't wait until you have demand for a product before you build infrastructure. So the, uh, the challenge is getting that, um, that balance right at the end of the day. And so you have to consider these two things together. Um, so, um, <clears throat> so starting on, on the issue of the speed and the development of the hydrogen market and how the EU needs to, to focus on that. So, okay, firstly, the foundation of any EU or any member state policy on hydrogen has to be predicated on achieving the Green Deal. I think we, we all agree that. And when, when you see the IPCC um, saying that globally we need a 45% cut of CO2 by 2030 and complete global decarbonization by 2050 to keep us 1.5 degree, you realize that the, um, the Green Deal objectives are not that ambitious after all. Um, but on the other hand, you can't forget the issue of competitiveness um, in terms of dividing an energy policy, in terms of jobs and growth, and in terms of ensuring you still have citizen support to a decarbonization policy. And support should uh, certainly not be taken for granted in the context of rapidly spiraling energy prices if the rest of the world is still failing to, um, to deal with climate change as we have. Um, but again, it has to be, any policy has to be predicated on achieving the Green Deal. Um, and it's very important to realize actually in the debate that the issue of hydrogen and hydrogen costs has really important um, consequences in terms of competitive jobs and growth when you think what the hydrogen is going to be used for. It's going to be used for, for a feedstock, for feedstock for hydrogen, um, fertilizers, um, methanol, and high heat energy intensive industry. So the production of uses energy in steel and cement, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we all know that ETS prices are going to have to be very high in order to catalyze um, low carbon or renewable hydrogen, either into replacing the gray hydrogen today or as an energy source. 
commission talks about 50 to 70 euros for um, replacing gray hydrogen. Most people find that conservative in terms of um, using it for an energy source. It's way higher than that. Um, steel cement, 20 to 40 percent of their production costs come from energy um, prices. Um, so the, the consequences of forcing um, hydrogen into this, these sectors um, is very, very important. And these, these sectors are on the carbon leakage list for a reason, um, which is, of course, that their energy costs are very high. And um, making these industries uncompetitive is not um, so that they delocalize outside the European Union is really not a solution to dealing with climate change. Because we all know very well you delocalize and we import the stuff and um, that will only create more CO2, not less. So this is a really, really tricky balance to, to do. Um, and I'd, I'd just like to um, make up four comments in this respect. Um, and it goes back to what Alberto said is predicting future costs um, and the CO2 um, price is needed uh, in order to determine how much um, green, blue or turquoise hydrogen you're going to need in 2030 and 2050 is practically impossible on the basis of what we know today. Um, first of all, we the, the technological level of development of all of these technologies is really rather low. Even electrolysis is basically a cottage industry um, in terms of the development of new, um, uh, a new plant, CCS, infant, and pyrolysis is equally, um, even though pyrolysis has, uh, I personally think, a great potential to be a, a pretty much a renewable source of hydrogen, it's still at a very low level of technological development and needs a great deal more. Um, secondly, the production of hydrogen is OPEX heavy. Um, it's, re it's, it's relatively little capex, it's mostly OPEX, and if, you're gonna, if we're going to pre um, predict the renewable electricity or gas prices in 2030, 2040, and 2050, well, good luck. Um, and then there are other issues that, um, that, to what extent we will have sufficient renewable electricity in 2030, 2040, and 2050 to meet our needs for hydrogen as well as renewable electricity. Um, the, these are all the uncertainties combined with the, the very significant ETS prices needed to cause switching. Um, so, but on the basis of these tentative conclusions for debate, I'd, I'd put forward four, um, four issues because the commission needs absolutely um, to have a fact-based policy in this respect. Um, and the first conclusion I would draw is obviously renewable energy remains the, um, the key priority in terms of energy policy and unblocking um, bottlenecks to renewable electricity meeting its uh, meeting goal is clearly the, the key objective. And the second one I would argue is research, research and development and industrial um, development of projects has to be by far the biggest priority at the moment, by far the biggest priority. Um, because until we get um, a much better idea Number one, until we get a much better idea of the real technology costs, it's impossible to really chart the speed of which you wish to bring hydrogen to the market, because only then will you know the ETS prices you really need in order to get it in. So should you bring massive subsidies in 2030, 2040? Yes, 20? I see. Now, you see me? OK. Thank you. But do you also hear me? So I muted. Because I don't, because I don't hear you. That's a problem. <laughs> Tudor, I, I don't hear Christoph. <laughs> Tudor, Tudor, can you hear us? Tudor, can, can we? Re um... uh, can you give me the access to the sound to hear? <laughs> Excuse, uh, I'm sorry about this technical hitch. Christopher, I know we still got two more issues on your list, so. Do you want me to continue? I think if you wouldn't mind, yes, Tudor's on mute now, so if you wouldn't mind, okay. continue, thank um, you. So I'm saying research and development is, is key in order to get real clarity in relation to the ETS prices you actually need in order to get hydrogen to the market and maintain a policy of how quickly you want to do it. And secondly, the arguments that, that were relevant in 2009 
which is you need to develop hydrogen, sorry, renewable electricity demand in order to create the economies of scale to get renewable electricity costs down are not quite so relevant in relation to hydrogen because in renewable electricity, you need hundreds of millions of panels. Uh, in hydrogen, not so much. So R and D and I are the key elements here. Um, but what is clear is that there will be a two-step development in what we know so far. And the first is the replacement of gray hydrogen. Um, and the second is its use in high heat energy intensive industry. Those will be the two steps if you see the expected ETS price necessary to substitute that. And that brings you already some first conclusions in relation to the development of the grid. Um, the, the other one is that in order to ensure the low cost development of hydrogen of the market, you need to be colorblind and let the market determine the relevant balance, not political decisions. Um, so, um, moving now to the issue of infrastructure, because, you know, I, I've argued to a certain extent, um, before you give massive subsidies to hydrogen production, um, get the cost of hydrogen production down. Um, and secondly, be very careful of the speed in which you make this transition um, in order to have a cost effective approach. But in relation to infrastructure, this is really one area um, you can't wait until 2030, 2040, and 2050, um, because you're always going to have to balance the importance of getting a cost-effective introduction of this new um, energy vector into the market and the need to make sure we actually get there by 2050. For none of this, you can wait until 2040 and then say, let's pull the button and um, start doing it. You need to ramp up um, production capacity. And infrastructure is, is one of the areas that we need to start investing today. And what, what is clear, it is, it is, and perhaps somebody can do this, but I can't, it is not possible on the basis of the technological knowledge that we have today um, regarding green versus turquoise, the how much domestic heating we will have from hydrogen compared to heat pumps, uh, how much transport, the ETS switching costs. We will not know the exact topography of the hydrogen grid yet. That will not happen until 2030. Um, perhaps even a little bit later, but there are some things that we do know. We do know some no regrets things. We know that first of all, the, um, the first demand for hydrogen will be in the clusters that we all know very, very well. And um, it seems to me very clear that it's the no regrets option to link these clusters with the backbone. Because if you don't, you will clearly develop a system of local monopolies of hydrogen production in these clusters. And as Lee can, can explain as well, um, under competition law, trying to break, break up monopolies is really, really difficult. Um, and so the best approach is to prevent monopolies developing and dominant positions developing before they become that place. So work needs to start now, in my opinion, in order to um, prevent this um, entrenched dominance in the clusters. And that is the backbone. And that needs to be a priority of the European Union under the European Recovery Plan and under the Connecting Europe facility in order to get this done in the short, not the long term. And then that can be the base, the, the backbone on which can be built. The second thing is any such backbone, any hydrogen grid, in order to, to meet our goals, will need to operate under the same conditions as the existing gas network. So third party access, unbundling, regulated tariffs, these basic provisions will need to apply. That does not mean I think you, you should simply transpose the existing gas directive and all the gas um, grid codes onto the hydrogen network. You need a step-by-step -step and phased approach, but the basic principles need to start from the outset in order to develop a competitive hydrogen market. Thank you, Lee, um, and I'll leave it there. Thank you very much indeed, and thank you, um, Chris, for um, a very, very clear exposition of uh, the issues at stake and um, for stepping in um, before Tudor. I think we can hopefully connect Tudor now. Is that possible? Um, Lee, unfortunately, it's not because uh, he cannot hear us. So we can hear him, but it's difficult for him to interact this way. So we are still on the phone with him. Uh, my apologies. Okay, so I should just um, turn to our next uh, panelist. Um, uh, so 
We're very pleased uh, to have Yorko here from Hydrogen Europe. Um, I, I realize it's a bit difficult to comment when you haven't heard Tudor's speech, but I'm sure um, you're very well versed again in the EU hydrogen strategy, and you might also like to pick up on some of the themes that Christopher introduced. You have five minutes, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lee, and uh, thanks for the opportunity uh, to talk here. Thanks, Alberto, for uh, inviting. Uh, I, I think I would like to pick up uh, at where um, Christopher just uh, finished the backbone idea. It's exactly uh, what is, so to say, in the focus also of the of the strategy, the Highland strategy, but also of um, what industry is wishing for is to go for the low hanging fruit, which is industrial clusters, which is uh, the uh, petrochemical, the chemical uh, and steel industry that needs simply hydrogen already. Uh, and if it's then green hydrogen, that would uh, allow us to have the first customers. Now, I would try to <clears throat> analyze the issue of uh, how we go there. And I like very much the figures that have been presented by uh, Piero. Um, um, I, I like the, 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 the clear view on the price, on, the, uh, on how much it costs by saying, if we want to go net zero in 2050, we need to go for more renewables. That's, I think, uh, understandable. But if we go for much more renewables, we have an issue, a physical issue, which is the power grid. The power grid is simply too small. That is why we need to use the asset, the asset we have, which is the gas grid. That's the most important reason why we are looking into hydrogen, because it allows the integration of even much more renewable energy into the energy system. Plus the transport costs of molecules are much lower than the transport costs of electrons. Um, and I think this is also an important factor. Um, there are countries where the energy costs are, or the transport costs are 20 times higher uh, compared to electricity. So transporting molecules or hydrogen would be 20 times cheaper than electricity. So this is uh, important and this finds some echo also in the hydrogen strategy of um, the European Commission. However, it needs now to be fed in uh, into the 10 year plans, into the 10 E regulation. Uh, we know that the commission has shown a lot of commitment, a lot of clear commitment to go down that route. But we are waiting for the 10 E regulation connecting Europe facility uh, by the end of the year. Now, what the hydrogen strategy clearly says, I want to give you just some numbers, is that this commission has linked itself, has, has so to say, uh, forced itself to produce via industry 1 million ton of renewably produced hydrogen until the end of their term, the end of their mandate. It's quite remarkable, I would say. It's unheard of. It's not normal that a commission says, we, this is our litmus test. This is what we want to achieve. And uh, the Hydrogen Alliance, here you see the banner of the Clean Hydrogen Alliance, is so to say the tool with which we want to implement the strategy. 1 million ton 2024 and 10 million tons in 2030. Six gigawatt uh, up to 40 gigawatt. Uh, and this gives us an understanding of the volume that needs to be produced and needs to be consumed. And that's uh, the, the most important problem also to overcome chicken and egg. And here we come back to the infrastructure. The infrastructure linking first the industrial clusters, the low hanging fruit, the no regret uh, solution will be basically uh, the backbone, uh, the first, the starting point of the backbone uh, for a later uh, hydrogen infrastructure which will be dense. Uh, we also have tomorrow uh, a launch of an idea where we link the pipeline system with the automotive system. So the 10E cor corridors, if you wish, with the 10T, the transport corridors. Uh, tomorrow we will present some figures uh, in a public event, uh, which shows how to come from Sicily up to Oslo using the ScanMet corridor based on pipeline systems carrying pure hydrogen and fueling the uh, hydrogen refueling stations which are above. Uh, so we will present some figures 
that show that even mobility, uh, especially in the hard to abate sector, uh, can profit uh, uh, from that uh, development very much so. Now, what's the cost? Because um, Christopher made crystal clear that there should be no risk or no uh, adventure. Um, we have presented um, after the two times 40 gigawatt paper, so two times 40 gigawatt until 2030, which was um, echoed by the hydrogen strategy, 40 gigawatt in Europe, 40 gigawatt outside Europe, so Northern Africa, Ukraine. We have presented also uh, a plan, we call it the blueprint for hydrogen 2030, how to consume, how to transport and consume this. Uh, all in all, we land at an investment of 430 billion euro in 10 years, out of which one third is public and two thirds are um, private investments. When it comes to the infrastructure, the figures are 100 billion, 120 billion of euro to be invested, not only in the transport and not, not only in the pipelines, but also in the, in the storage infrastructure, because you, you, we have to see this as a, uh, as a unit, uh, this transport and also the storage, otherwise um, it would make sense, uh, out of which some 15 billion would be subsidies. So here you see um, the ratio, which is uh, some amount of 15 billion uh, of uh, subsidies that are needed and much more of private investment. Um, and we are happy to announce that uh, our CEOs in, in Hydrogen Europe are very committed uh, to support this uh, transition, this systemic change. So I was myself uh, some, somehow overwhelmed also. 110 CEOs from big companies um, signed. Last remark, Christopher said it already. It's not about CAPEX. It's definitely about OPEX. So I was concentrating now four years on, on hydrogen and Tudor, our, our uh, commission speaker is, is one of the first movers in the, in the hydrogen field. So we owe him a lot to be, to be clear. And I was concentrating and I hope it helped. However, now we will concentrate extremely and very much on state aid rules. A systemic change will not be possible if we don't understand that OPEX is more important now and 100% funding in, in certain areas will be uh, of utmost importance. Otherwise, we cannot do the systemic change. Um, it's, um, it's a change, also a systemic change in our thinking, and that goes along uh, with a successful strategy. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you very much indeed. Um, again, a very clear presentation, lots of interesting issues and food for thought. Um, and we have now Tudor, um, hopefully uh, ready to go. Um, Hello. Yes, there he is. Welcome, Tudor. I'm sorry you had some connection problems. Um, I'm sure you understood we had to, to press ahead without you, but luckily you could hear us, I believe, even if we couldn't hear you. Or No, thank you. I'm, I'm happy finally I got connected. So, and I didn't hear you, but um, okay. I'm, I'm sorry. So I hope I will hear the rest of it. So now it's working. So tell me, Oli, uh, if you want me still to use the slides which I was prepared for the beginning or, uh, or not? Well, um, if you think that you're able to stick to the time um, that we gave you, the so, time slot, then... The 10 uh, minutes. 10 minutes, yes. I leave it really yeah. up to you. Okay, I can, I can share maybe the screen and show some slides quickly uh, without... Uh, Tell me if you. There, if I can see them, thank you. I think. Uh... But uh, uh, is there is a, is there a problem here, or because I don't know what you see. So we see um, problem. Tudor, I'm sharing your presentation on. Your ah, you share it, so then next. I don't need to worry yes. about it. Yes, you don't need to worry. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay, just that then I have to uh, take, okay, so then if you share it, thank you very much. Now, very, very, very quickly, and to tie to, to, to stick to the time frame, and uh, I guess, uh, and I heard a little bit from Jorgo, I guess he already told you the most important things for scaling up hydrogen. Uh, let me just anchor this a little bit into the commission uh, uh, plans right now which are, first of all, the Green Deal. And you have heard the latest on the target for uh, 
in how gas emission reductions from our president von der Leyen, the 55% target uh, for 2030. And uh, this has clear implications on the whole energy system. For renewables, for example, we say now that for electricity uh, uh, might be 65% by 2030. So, and this brings us to what was a very important piece of work during this year, which was on energy system integration and how to make better interlink between electricity, gas, heat networks. And I think this is something which is of the strongest interest when it comes also to the regulatory framework for the energy system. Uh, and it is in this context that we also came up with the strategy. I will pass very quickly through it because I guess it was mentioned and you have seen it, which tries to push uh, an investment agenda to boost the demand, uh, supply at the same time to develop the infrastructure, to tackle research and innovation and to make sure that we can play it internationally. Um, to be supported by the Hydrogen Alliance, which was launched at the same time as the strategy itself. What is important here, and speaking about these uh, objectives on greenhouse gas emission reductions, um, is that we need to achieve this to invest already now and to have in terms of capital investments, most of the investment in this decade and not to postpone as it was in other previous scenarios after 2030. Making the investments now will ensure that not only we achieve faster decarbonization, but also reduce the effort later on and through investments now start and support economic recovery as well. So these two things uh, get uh, now very well together and through investments in the Green Deal, we actually can help very much the recovery plans and uh, the next generation EU. Next slide. Uh, I'll, uh, quickly pass because I'm sure your mentioned, so it's clear the targets we have mainly for renewable energy and the concepts we try to promote in particular to decarbonize carbon intensive sectors, to have hydrogen valleys and to bring to possibilities for hydrogen in industrial clusters, in ports, in coastal areas to, to put a strong focus uh, on that. And we have a time frame for the entire strategy going up to 2050, but already ambition started in 2024 and with upscaling to 40 gigawatts in 2030. Next slide. To achieve this, it's clear that we need to invest also in renewables. And we estimated about 80 to 120 uh, gigawatts necessary of, uh, of renewables. And uh, a lot of investments has to go into this. And uh, here you have, uh, of course, all the sources of funding which you can support, but we need to attract also the member states in, in these uh, endeavors and also the private sector more important. Uh, also for renewable hydrogen, for transport, distribution, storage, for um, uh, decarbonizing the transport sector, in particular the heavy duty, but also maritime, later on with uh, uh, synthetic fuels, aviation, and so, plus the steel and the uh, fertilizers, ammonia. Next slide. You see, I'm moving, I'm moving fast because I think many of the things have been said, but it's clear that this is the most important, to make this link and to support the decarbonization of these sectors through uh, uh, renewable hydrogen in particular. For this, we need to create the markets. We need certification of renewables. We need uh, maybe targets in specific sectors and new sectors and the infrastructure which to ensure access to all consumers and the competitive market to be developed gradually for, for hydrogen. The next one. In terms of, uh, of infrastructure, we need um, uh, to, to be able to have a common low carbon threshold for hydrogen production facilities. So the priority for us is renewable hydrogen, but I acknowledge that in, 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 in this period, we'll also need maybe other forms of low carbon hydrogen. Currently, 95% of, uh, of the hydrogen we use is actually neither low carbon or renewable, it's just uh, so-called gray hydrogen, steam reforming, most of it, but also from coal gasification. So we need to move away from this situation if we want hydrogen to play effectively a role in, in the energy and climate agenda. So uh, we'll um, do the certification for renewable and low carbon hydrogen. We'll need to revise also the threshold in the emission trading scheme to develop mechanisms like the carbon for uh, contracts for difference and to develop uh, support schemes, particularly for renewables. 
At the same time, on the infrastructure, there is work going on also for vehicles. The alternative directive is in place and we'll need to, to review on this, but also the 10E uh, regulations and the development of 10 year development plans. I'll come uh, in a moment back to this. Next slide, please. Uh, in terms of research innovation, efforts have to continue. I have to say that most of the, uh, what you see now and also the basis of the alliance and so find the roots in the cooperation, in the partnership we have developed actually to industry in the context of the fuel cells and hydrogen joint undertaking. So this type of partnership is extremely important. If we want to maintain competitiveness, we also need to, to invest further in research and uh, demonstrations across the scale from production to infrastructure and use applications and also uh, to, to make sure that safety is always high on the agenda and standards are developed and in particular uh, in you to, to make sure that we, we move uh, quickly on this as it is to ensure uh, that we uh, recycle and make uh, best use of critical raw materials. Next slide. Uh, and this is about international collaboration, where uh, it's a lot uh, in the strategy is mentioned very clear the priority for uh, the neighborhood uh, uh, area and for the collaboration in the context of the Africa European Green Initiative. But uh, we need to also cooperate in multi international fora, clean energy ministerial, in particular on deployment, mission innovation, particularly research and hydrogen valleys. International Partnership for Hydrogen Economy, in particular for standards and regulations. And this is maybe the initial phase of international collaboration, which uh, has uh, pushed until today. And here uh, again, uh, to, to give credit to the fact that through advancement in research, we have succeeded to be at the stage we are now. 10 years ago, an electrolyzer was 10 kilowatt. Now we speak, uh, we have one of 10 uh, megawatt in operation in Cologne and another of 20 megawatts under construction and through the Green Deal call under Horizon uh, 2020, uh, this year will uh, start 100 megawatt electrolyzer construction next year. Uh, so in terms of uh, legislation here briefly and uh, related to this, we don't start from scratch. We have the RED, the new uh, directive, where we already mentioned guarantees and we have introduced the guarantees of origin specifically also for hydrogen. We have asked uh, already in this context that existing gas network infrastructure to facilitate the integration of renewable uh, gases. Um, not directly for hydrogen, but the concept of energy storage was very important in the whole clean energy for all package because it allowed not only power to power, but also power to X solutions, including power to gas and power to heat. And there is a, if you want the kind of precedent here requiring the DSOs and district heating operators to collaborate on storage. We can envisage this also for hydrogen for large scale storage for hydrogen in various energy networks. Uh, the greenhouse gas emissions uh, of renewable liquid and gaseous transport fuels of non-biological origin should be also uh, limited to 70% from January next year. Uh, we also have provisions on uh, re how to treat the electricity used for the production of renewable fuels of non biological origin, and the delegated acts are currently under preparation, including on the greenhouse gas emission uh, savings from this type of uh, fuels. The methodologies for calculation, which are also important because this is something we will need also to address internationally. Next slide, please. Um, therefore, and in line with the strategy, and the energy system integration strategy also. Uh, now we need to accelerate the development of the different type of uh, refueling infrastructure. Uh, we try to develop the market rules for deployment of hydrogen and to remove barriers, first of all, for uh, hydrogen infrastructure development, either new or through the purposing of gas infrastructure. We need to start the planning of the hydrogen infrastructure through the trans european network for energy and transport and the 10e is currently under revision for this year and the same goes for the 10t uh, and the 10 years net development plans will have to be uh, consistent with uh, with our decarbonization objective next slide please the so you ask, uh, yes, you this is my me. last slide thank this you is my last thank slide you. yeah so uh, because uh, this is a point where um, I think we need to see what uh, kind of regulation is necessary. So uh, depending also on what uh, role can gas infrastructure play in the EU path to decarbonization by 2050. The point is that uh, final energy consumption means not only electricity, means electricity, gaseous fuels, liquid fuels, and with 
evolving shares. Now electricity is only 23%. By 2050, maybe 50%. But still half of the energy, final energy consumption is the form of gas and liquid fuels. And both these gases and liquid fuels will have to be decarbonized. So, uh, and if we say to decarbonize this, of course, you'll have, for example, methane, but this may not be enough. So hydrogen will be a key neighbor for both uh, uh, gases, decarbonized gases, and also for synthetic fuels. In the first phase, we may have some injections into the natural gas grids. We may have 100% uh, hydrogen networks. We may also have, also have other options like synthetic methane, as you know, the price, carbon capture uh, price of CO2 from the air is going down, and uh, there are estimates by 2040 can be competitive. So we need, to, in this context, to see what we need to regulate now, what we need to regulate later, what is the role, actually, of regulation in a decarbonized energy system where we need to operate jointly electricity, gas, and heat networks. I think this is a, a big change where we need to take action what is important at local level, and also what is important at uh, European level and uh, how we can uh, encourage the market developments in line with the policy objectives and uh, uh, what we need maybe to adjust in terms of uh, the approach we have for regulation. So happy to continue uh, and contribute to the discussion on this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, and uh, sorry to rush you a little bit, uh, but the, the clock is ticking and we will have hopefully time uh, uh, to turn to um, the many questions that we're getting through uh, the Q&A. Um, but I first of all uh, like to give our last two panellists the opportunity, um, unique opportunity uh, in this case to comment uh, on Tudor's uh, presentation. Uh, so Stefan, would you like to, to comment? Stefan Campuez from NCG? Yeah, thank you for having me and thank you for the uh, possibility. Um, Judo, listening to you now um, in the in the close to the last quarter of 2020, then everything sounds as if it would have been there all the time. But um, I remember the last year, then we were not talking that directly, and it was not that mature. But suddenly there was uh, the the giant step, I would say, and that was. The adaptation of the um, hydrogen strategy, and um, this this is now also a, a very personal remark. After more than twenty years of struggling with the direction that uh, energy uh, should take, and all the debates, yeah, I, I'm happy, and I will re really, I will come, and we will come. Uh, the hydrogen strategy, in particular, also in so far as it will give a societal uh, reunion, because this is a very pragmatic approach that can do the trick in total. And that also seems to be for the first time now really widely uh, supported. So you have perhaps not only found the way out of the dilemma that we had, but it is also maybe a, a joint societal way forward. So that, that is a, a huge step. And um, I can imagine that Yorgo feels very much pleased that after these many years, now we are there and then uh, perhaps Christopher feels the same way because he says what I have done in 2003 to 2009 uh, could be the right thing even for the coming 20 and 30 years. I mean, I would have debated with Christopher very much maybe in 2003, but we are beyond that. And today I think uh, this is a different world. So my reaction, my immediate reaction is I'm happy that we are one year ahead, uh, but now uh, we have to turn that into practical terms. And that is uh, uh, indeed a huge challenge because we have constructed a lot of infrastructure and a lot of energy appliances. And now we start again. And not everybody will welcome that, in particular in this NIMBY world where nobody wants something to be constructed in his neighborhood. But we have to do it. I mean, the, the point is clear. Maybe one remark to the clusters and the backbones. Um, we all have started with, with clusters and we all had to go from points of production into the industrial uh, hotspots to, to bring energy there. And that will continue to be the case. And if you build today a cluster, then you always have to think about how large should it be? And it cannot be that you just think for yourself. If you construct something, you have to think about the next 10 years at least and ask yeah. your neighbors, is anyone joining on this project? Um, and then transport rather a lot um, at, a short, at a low price than having 10 uh, times. Um, I'm happy that, that, that we are now here. 
um, we have behind us a long way. We are today in, in a very complicated, unbundled world, um, but we are rebundling certain things. And that is the next level. This is very much about the bundling of electricity and gas. Uh, something that we already have started, that is clear because of the renewables, it was necessary to find a better balancing for the network. But you can imagine that now, if we are to store green electricity in gaseous and molecule form, we need a, a much closer cooperation. And we need a, a much more focused view on locations. Where can you combine these networks? Yeah, in order mm. to make sure that you do have a lead, least cost approach. So I'm, uh, I'm, I believe that we need a necessary framework. And um, it was uh, Yorgos and it was um, Christopher's view that this should be a stepwise approach and not a one-to-one -one copy immediately. And I think that is absolutely correct um, because this new um, legislation or regulation will also uh, to have to take in, uh, into account the new challenges um, because this interconnection and this storing um, is something that our customers might find very complicated. So it will be more an infrastructure task to prepare the market and let then the market participants act on the market. And if you see that we have to come uh, from um, the, this fossil world into a non-fossil world, um, while at the same time maintaining the security of supply, it is also clear that we re need rules for the transition. Um, because even if I have a, an east-west transport today, and this is one track with four pipes. I have to agree with the customers of natural gas and the customers of hydrogen on how to go from here to there. Shall I repurpose two of the li lines? Who needs it? Uh, who wants it? Who has the production for it? Shall it be three, one? Even this simple question needs a, a good cooperation between the customers and the market participants and leave alone then the, 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 the part of the um, um, security of supply. We are retiring. I think everybody talks about in 35, 40, we are out of coal. Uh, that is not the issue. We are retiring practically every week power stations today. So we also make sure, need to make sure that we get there and wherever we can start with hydrogen immediately. So this cluster and backbone is something that will happen from my point at the same time. But be uh, aware of the fact, if I would like to build something today, infrastructure-wise, even if it's gas, not electricity, I need five years. For repurposing, I need a lot of agreements with the customers um, and that they can prepare that. So it all takes time. We need to go into a form of um, uh, legal background to that and then take it from there step by step in order to have something meaningful in 35. So in five years, the first step, in 10 years, the next step, in 15 years, the next step, but a certain framework is really required. Uh, Still, I could like, uh, would like to discuss with Alberto and um, with Christopher in particular what we have achieved and what could be changed. But I think it is inevitable that we will need some regulation to get from A to B now, in particular as time is pressing. And in particular, as, as you all pointed it out, this will not be based on uh, competition only. There will be state aid needed to get all the three things production, consumption, and infrastructure started at the same time. Thank you very much. There are lots, again, lots of issues um, to, to try to squeeze into one short webinar is uh, <laughs> quite difficult, in fact. I think you've given us food for thought for many more. I'd like to turn to our last panel member, um, Annika Francois, um, from the Dutch uh, regulator. Uh, the floor is yours, Annika, and I would, I'm sorry, but uh, we're a bit pressed for time. Just if, so if you could um, limit your intervention to five minutes, it would yes. be greatly appreciated. Thank yes. you. Uh, I understand your questions, and I've, there are lots of things already said and uh, to, to discuss. But just first, I would like to, to know that, um, well, thank you uh, very much for, uh, for the invitation to participate. Um, and I'm sitting here because... Um, well, you wanted to take advantage of the experience of hydrogen in the, in the Netherlands, and indeed in the Netherlands, many things are going on. But as a regulator, I must say, actually, we are still also in a, in a stage of exploring the debate and intensifying the, the relevant questions and looking for the answers that are popping up in this debate. Um, so for me as well, this is something uh, uh, in the exploration phase. But 
Having said that, uh, to reflect on, on the, the central question that was posed for this debate, uh, whether the future hydrogen network will inevitably uh, exhibit similar features to the natural gas networks and should be regulated in a similar way, I would first like to note that hydrogen transport um, compared to gas and electricity is it's not similar in the sense that uh, regulation for gas and electricity networks was introduced while the infrastructure was already developed. And now we are in a stage that the hydrogen infrastructure still needs to be developed. And in addition, looking forward, and um, Tudor already mentioned it, if we are having a more integrated energy system, even if the regulation for gas and electricity networks might evolve as well. So for me at this stage, it's you can't say that transport of hydrogen should be regulated in a similar way as it is for gas now, because they have similar features. Well, second, well, from a regulatory uh, regulator's perspective, I want to bring into debate the actual role uh, and position of, of regulation. Uh, I think it's important to note that well, ex ante regulation is it intended for putting in place measures to address a market failure. To me, uh, regulation is not a tool to incentivize or disincentivize the development of any activity. It's a, it's a tool to address a market failure. Uh, for instance, the, the existence of a natural monopoly with, mon monopoly with a risk of abuse of dominance. So whether or not to regulate should, be, should not start by looking at similarities between sectors, but should, be start, should start by looking at the ex expected market circumstances. Um, well, uh, and if you look at this stage, I don't see really these, these market failures at this time. So probably you don't need regulation now, but if you look in the, in the future, and I think that's the thing we're all struggling with, um, it might change. And if you look at the scenarios developed in the, um, but if the scenarios develop in accordance with developments outlined in the EU uh, hydrogen strategy of the European Commission, Commission market uh, circumstances will dramatically change. The question is, is how? Because from the first presentation, we saw there are many different ways of transporting hydrogen, but if pipeline transport uh, will be a, a major part of it, then a hydrogen network might likely show characteristics of a natural monopoly. And that will give, in my opinion, reason for implementing uh, regulation. Well, having said that, um, I'm aware that uncertainty over possible future regulation might hamper investment now. So even if you don't, regulation is needed at this moment, it might be needed uh, in the future. Therefore, and, and, and also based on the experience we had with implementing regulation uh, at the time that the sector was already developed, I think it will be of help if hydrogen regulation framework is designed from the outset, just making clear upfront uh, when regulation of networks should kick in given circum cir uh, market circumstances and uh, upfront developing uh, the general principles of that regulation in advance. In my opinion, the actual introduction of uh, specific regulatory features should kick in gradually in line with the development of the hydrogen infrastructure and, and market development. Um, and, um, a regular market test, for instance, at the national level, um, like what we have in the, in the telecom sector, but that on a cer different circumstances, but just to give a parallel, could be an appropriate manner to assess the market circumstances, identifying the need of regulation and when it should uh, kick in. Well, that's my brief contribution. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, was brief but very rich, and uh, I think you you brought up a lot of important issues about how to regulate. Um, now we have um, now two polling questions, uh, which we would like uh, to pose to the audience. So, um, Chiara, are you able to get them up? Thank you very much. Um, so um, these questions were also uh, reproduced in in the program for today. Um, so having heard the discussion. Uh, maybe you'd like to reflect on these questions. Uh, the first question is um, to use a term from US uh, antitrust law or competition law. Um, do we think this um, hydrogen network of the future will be what we call an essential facility? Uh, in other words, um, these networks can't be duplicated. They will be monopolies. 
in the clusters perhaps or as a backbone. Uh, so that means that some form of regulation will be inevitable uh, for access conditions and tariffs. So you have three options. Yes, no, or I'm not sure, maybe. There's a lot of red. So um, certainly the no's are in a definite minority um, and the not sure's um, are still outvoted by those who think um, that the network could be some form of essential facility. Okay, well, we'll come back to these results. So, uh, let's go to the, the second question, please. So I think I can close that. So Chiara, if you could put up the, the second question. And this is, I think, taking up uh, some of the themes from Annika's presentation too. Um, what kind of uh, regulation do we need? Um, do we want uh, ex ante? Uh, so get the regulatory framework right. Uh, several um, of the panelists have already said how important that is to stimulate investment, uh, but regulators might um, think, or competition officials or, or uh, governments might think it's sufficient just to um, exercise ex post control and just um, keep that um, as the option. So would you like to vote? <laughs> Something gone wrong. The, the C should be, I'm not sure. I think there's been a bit of a, a pro, uh, an error there. Sorry about that. So if you're not sure, you can opt for the third one. But it looks like uh, ex ante uh, wins the day here also. So I'll close the poll and I'd like to thank the audience for participating. And I'd like then um, to turn uh, back um, to uh, the outcome of the polls and to um, some of the questions coming from the audience. Uh, now we've had a lot of questions um, coming through um, and I'll see if we can uh, pick up some of um, the issues um, and link them to, to the polling questions or the outcome of the polls. Um, so maybe I'll start with um, a question uh, from Yavat uh, Kaipur. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Um, and he would like to um, address actually a question to, directly to Christopher Jones, but I'm sure other panelists could comment on it also in the light of the uh, outcomes to the polls. Um, um, and it's a, it's a very good question, you know, uh, where are we starting from for grey hydrogen? Um, can the, ga the current gas directive already cover that or do we actually need to start um, developing a new directive um, to, to cover the new, new types of, high, of fuels? So grey hydrogen we might be able to fit um, in. Um, and then he asks, are there enough or a sufficient legal basis to distinguish gray and green uh, hydrogen or to treat uh, hydrogen differently uh, when it's for storage, electricity storage, as opposed to final gas consumption? So I think that's a question that it's, it's uh, well, many questions and it picks up on quite a lot of the themes uh, that we have been discussing. Where do we start? So Christopher, I think you were named, but I'm sure everyone would like to, to comment. Would you mind, Christopher, to, to take the first bite at the cherry? No, not a problem. Um, so I, I would argue that the foundations of the gas directive provide the basis for the future regulation of the hydrogen market, because um, I, I think the last polling um, exercise showed a couple of, that are at least for me, givens. Um, which is the hydrogen network will be a um, de facto essential service um, and that it will need to be regulated ex ante. And at the end of the day, those are the two foundations behind the gas directive that we wrote long, long time ago. Um, 
it, it's very true that, you know, as has been said earlier this afternoon, that there, there, is, a, there is a difference, which is um, the gas directive was um, developed to deal with a market that was much more mature, much more developed, um, rather than an emerging system. But it seems to me that the principles apply. So I would argue that the, um, the gas directive, to a very large extent, um, and the gas regulation um, can be applied to the emerging hydrogen market. Um, however, it, it obviously makes sense to take a, a very careful look at the balance between regulatory costs and effective regulation. Um, because if you look at all the grid codes that we have today, and I mentioned this earlier, if you look at all the grid codes, um, it's not entirely apparent that um, the, the detail of the grid codes would be applicable to the, the gas market right from the beginning. I would argue they would not be, and that you would have to take a case-by-case -case approach in that respect. Um, Lee, what, what are the issues apart from that, um, as simple as that complaint? Sorry, you, you broke up a little bit. Uh, sorry, yes. Yeah. So let me get the question back up there. Um, I don't know if you can also see it in the Q and A. Um, so I think I think the essence of the question, if I'm right, um, is that um, for grey hydrogen, you know, do we really need to get into a completely new uh, directive? We can perhaps just tweak some of the, the terminology. Um, and then the second question was uh, distinguishing the way we treat hydrogen when we look at its um, end use. So electricity storage as opposed to final consumption, uh, final gas consumption. Um, I mean, obviously this is going to be um, linked to the question of guarantees of origin in a way, um, because a hydrogen molecule is a hydrogen molecule, a hydrogen molecule, like an electron is an electron. Um, and so it's pretty impossible to differentiate between them. So um, I, I would argue that um, the, the whole hydrogen system needs to become an integrated market, um, which you can then use um, the guarantees of origin in order to um, make it, I'm not going to use the word liquid, um, but functioning. Um, regarding the end use, I'm, I'm not convinced, um, but although we're getting into details that probably require a little more thought at this stage, um, require a differentiated approach. But I'd, I'd be very interested to hear what the other panellists have got to say on this. Okay, so, so Tudor, would you be happy to, to take some of those questions? Yeah, thank you. If you want, I can um, continue a little bit um, along the line of um, Christopher. Now, on, um, I would say we have to, we have first of all to, to recognize that because our terminology with the gas infrastructure and looking, let's be honest, so far, uh, hydrogen was not recognized as an energy carrier. And from the perspective of the, of the gas uh, networks was considered a technical gas, so not an energy carrier. So we, we come quite from far. So now, now we move into another uh, era when we try to use hydrogen, not only as an energy carrier, but furthermore, as a, as a solution to linking different parts of the energy system. And speaking about um, what kind of regulation, ex ante and uh, or post, I think we need to prepare the ground for this opportunity of handling um, uh, at the same time, uh, electricity gas networks and to see what kind of regulation is necessary maybe in, in this respect on one hand. On, uh, on the other hand, uh, we have to see when we upscale and go to, to larger quantities uh, to make sure and to, to draw of course from the lessons and to use uh, whatever we have from, um, from the gas markets, but without um, making things too difficult maybe in, in the beginning. This is, uh, okay, at least my um, personal opinion, because if we, uh, if we start to regulate too heavily uh, the, the traffic of the cars before having any cars, uh, it might be discouraging uh, anyone to get a car. 
So I, I think we have to find a, a right balance here. And definitely there is a role for some ex-ante regulation and to preparing the framework. There is even furthermore a role to try to see how we can better link and uh, operate. And uh, I think this was a very well pointed on the, uh, on, on the issue of um, uh, electricity gas networks, how to better uh, ensure the link between them. And uh, for hydrogen, if we want to contribute to carbonization, of course, what uh, Christopher was mentioning, it's, uh, it's a guarantee of origin, the certificate, to, to, to ensure in a way that uh, we uh, know what we speak about and we reward what we want to reward and to, to see what uh, contribution can have to, to the market. So, uh, yeah, and uh, as, uh, as the market will become more liquid and fluid, then will uh, will uh, will adapt so the there is a need for certain dynamics in in this regulatory process as well at least the the way i see it i have to unmute myself yorgo i think you waved a hand that you might like yes to yes, yes just uh, to shortly say uh, there is already a system for gray hydrogen uh, that is in use uh, but it's B2B, it's not unbundled, and um, it, so we don't need another regulation for that, because it exists. However, if we now turn into a pure hydrogen backbone system, um, there I have a slight different um, idea um, from, uh, as, uh, in, in comparison to Christopher. Um, I think we need a hydrogen market design. So if it's about blending, fine, we can live with gas. If it's about pure hydrogen, uh, we should not take the guarantee of origin principle from the gas world, nor should we take the uh, guarantee of origin uh, system of the electricity world, um, because both are not transparent and clear enough. Uh, we are in talks uh, with, especially with uh, the biggest renewable producers in the world to develop something that creates a, a system with five T's, uh, traceable, trackable, uh, uh, tradable, it needs to be tradable, uh, it needs to be transparent in order to uh, deliver trust. We need a trustworthy system where a molecule can be traced back. Where does it come from? Even if it's virtually, and there we are starting to work with different technologies, blockchain is one of them, however, we believe that um, this system should be so transparent that even the other two systems, electricity and gas, could learn from that. I know that this, this sounds a little bit, but it, it, we need to go innovative ways in order to make the new commodity, clean hydrogen, trustworthy. And I talked about the five Ts. There is also the three Cs. Carbon content is the new currency. So that should be decisive, not the end use. Uh, so. Wherever it goes, it's the carbon content that needs to be priced if it's high and that needs to be um, unpriced, so lower price if it's low. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so turning to, um, we have very many questions, but maybe just picking up on that last remark, um, there is a question from Simona Capozza who would like, um, to um, ask the panel um, to address the topic of how carbon contracts for differences could be applied to hydrogen production and what benefits would that bring uh, for hydrogen development? Um, quite a, um, maybe a specific question, but uh, it's the, the concept of uh, carbon contracts featured in a number of the presentations today. So, um, would any of the panel members like to address that? So I think it's not that uh, uh, um, irritating as a question. I think it's, it's very relevant because um, this instrument, Contract for Difference, um, has been used uh, or has been envisaged in a lot of in, in renewable markets. And it seems to be appropriate. It, I, I say it seems to be appropriate also for, the, for um, renewably produced hydrogen. Um, because uh, we are now at the moment discussing different options, but this might be a shortcut. Um, and um, we can see in some member states of the European Union, a strong interest 
in this instrument um, and it's it's quite easy you can attribute the budget that you want to see there as a as a member state and then then you can go uh, and you can use the instrument so we find it very attractive but again it's uh, up to discussion internal discussion still thank you okay. would anyone else like to comment on that question yes christopher well I mean, obvious, I mean, if you, sorry, if you look at the hydrogen strategy, the Commission um, obviously looks at two different approaches. One is um, promoting research and development um, innovation. So that's a given, I'm just gonna discuss that. Um, then there is a question, how are we going to develop um, demand for hydrogen? And there's two ways we can do that. Um, we can, um, expose the hydrogen consuming industry to the ETS and the Commission obviously is looking at that with the carbon border tax. Um, even if they succeed in doing that and it will be very challenging to do that to the industry we're talking about and not still have carbon leakage that's a wider debate but even if they do that that will not get us to the price um, at least over the next 10 years at which either turquoise blue or green hydrogen will be likely to um, replace gray hydrogen today, let alone in high heat energy intensive industry. So therefore you need to have an additional subsidy in order to get people to produce the stuff. Um, and that's where the contract for difference comes in. So that is doing exactly the same at the end of the day of what we've done with renewable electricity which is to pay the difference between what people are willing to produce um, or buy green hydrogen and people are willing to guarantee to produce um, either green or blue hydrogen. And you can have a contract for difference that is um, technology neutral, or you can have one that is green. Um, my, my preference is for technology neutrality in order to have a cost-effective decarbonization. Um, but that, that's, that's a matter of opinion. Um, but carbon contractor differences are likely to be the, the cheapest way in order to, um, uh, to finance any such subsidies because it takes account of the um, OPEX element, which is inherent to the hydrogen production. So it doesn't fix a price because the, pr the price of producing either green or blue hydrogen will be dependent, as we mentioned earlier, on the renewable electricity price and on the um, natural gas price and they by definition float and when you have a, a contract for difference the subsidy will differ depending on how you set that contract for difference whether you set it on the basis of uh, the ver what, what your param parameter is for the contract for difference whether it's the base of the, um, the renewable electricity price or the grey hydrogen price so it's probably the, the most cost-effective way of doing it. Um, I think that then once you do that, you need to ask the question of how quickly you want to provide those um, support subsidies and whether you want them to be technology neutral. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, now the clock is ticking and um, I'd like to um, give Annika um, a, a question um, from Lorenz uh, Wieshammer, uh, who thanks you for your contribution. And um, he uh, observes, well, uh, you say regulation should only be um, used or resorted to if there is um, a market failure, uh, which is not the case with hydro, but um, do we need clear hydro regulation to um, kickstart investment, to reduce the uncertainty around investment, um, given uh, the much bigger market failure that we have too much CO2 um, in, uh, the air around us. So how do we take that externality into account? So I'm, I have to give you just a very um, short yeah. space to answer that question, a big question, yes. but maybe you'd like to. Yeah, uh, thank comment. you very much for the question. And I think it's a very good question because like the externality of the, the CO2, CO2 emissions is a, is a market failure in itself. Um, so, but the point I was referring to is like, regulation of the, the infrastructure network. Um, and I believe it, that kind of regulation is not 
uh, shouldn't be there to incentive to, to incentivize, for instance, developing activities or, or, or making investments. I think uh, uh, market should play a role there. Um, having said that, I, I don't have the answer to how you should then incorporate the externality of uh, the CO2 emissions. I think the ETS is 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 in, there are other instruments other entrance instruments than the regulation of networks that should uh, kickstart the development of the of the network. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to um, turn the floor over to Alberto uh, to offer uh, some concluding remarks um, before before we are shut down literally as I'm afraid we have only four minutes and then we're off the air. So Alberto, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And I also would like to uh, thank all the contributors, uh, those who have listened and, and submitted questions. I'm sorry if we haven't managed to um, deal with all of them. We had more than 100. I think at any point in time, we had more than 110. At some stage, we had 160 people connected. Um, very briefly, I've, in my note here, I've sort of come up with six six points. First, as it happens most in most recent hydro um, hydrogen uh, debate, um, there are a lot of issues and uh, we tend to jump, we tend to be tempted to jump to one issue or another and we covered more than um, we, we, we aimed at, uh, which is good because obviously there are a lot of question marks around. Second consideration is the, the results of our polls, I think gives an overwhelming um, um, uh, message that probably uh, hydrogen network infrastructure should be treated very very similarly to, um, uh, to, to, to electricity and gas. In a sense, there are uh, some uh, elements of essential facility monopoly, whatever you want to call it. So even though we may not just copy and paste it, we can take that as a blueprint and see which elements of it are still applicable to, uh, to gas. Um, I think there is an advantage here um, the fact that we are at the beginning of, uh, of, of this sector expansion, so as to speak, different from what we were with gas and electricity. So we, uh, we can plan, we can already have certainty for, for, for investors for the very beginning. I think investors like certainty, they like to know what they will be facing when it comes to uh, uh, the return on, on infrastructure. If we think, as we do, that uh, the situation may evolve over time, perhaps we can look at a toolbox where uh, things will adapt as we as we go along. Maybe initially we don't need to be so prescriptive, um, but um, but um, but but we can already plan a pathway uh, to become you know to 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 where how the the, the hydrogen network will be uh, will, will be will be developed now. In my introduction, I mentioned the fact that uh, maybe there is um, maybe there is um, what one of the aspects is how many alternative way we have to transport hydrogen. In fact, maybe I was wrong. Is how many ways you have to transport energy, and then a consideration should be um, should be um, should be had as to whether um, different networks might compete among themselves, and therefore they reduce their monopoly position. It seems from what. Piero presented to start with, and it's still, um, you know, early days anyway. The network, the the the, the transport of hydrogen through networks is, is still, or it will be likely the cheapest option with respect to other ways. So, network will have an advantage, will have an intrinsic monopoly, um, or at least you know a, a big cost advantage. Maybe there could be some competition between networks. This will have to be seen. Um, personally, I don't think that this will be strong enough. To, um, to remove the need for regulation. It seems that 73% uh, of those who were in the, in the, um, in, in the debate today uh, share this. However, it's clear that, it's clear that going forward, uh, we need to uh, coordinate the development of networks for different vectors. I think Stefan made the point that, you know, it's now we need to coordinate the gas with the electricity, probably with the hydrogen. So uh, this is an additional aspect that needs to be taking into account and finally unbundling. You cannot have a debate without talking about unbundling. Is there a role for um, TSOs? Is there a role for um, infrastructure operator when it comes to um, the non-infrastructure aspects? 
i.e., for example, power to gas. I think here we can have, again, a gradual approach at the beginning to kickstart the sector, they might have an approach. Mm -hmm. Later on, obviously, unbundled rules. Once the sector has started, unbundled rules should be applied more strictly. Perhaps the approach that was um, introduced by the European Commission for electric vehicles, charging facility and for storage in the clean energy package would also be applied with market tested um, as we go along and a flexible rule. So these are my six takeaways. I don't know what other things, but um, again, thank you very much. And thank you fully to Lee for uh, moderating this and to our colleagues in, 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 in Florence, Chiara and the others for making this possible. Thank you very much indeed, um, and uh, we have to leave you now, so um, thank you for uh, your particip participation this afternoon uh, for a very lively panel, and uh, my thanks also to Alberto for co-organising uh, the event, and we look forward uh, to seeing you at our next event, which is on the 28th of October, uh, where we'll be looking at offshore wind and in some infrastructural issues uh, that are coming up in that sector as well. Uh, I think there's a lot to keep us busy uh, in the coming months. So thank you very much and have a pleasant afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.